The Reform Gamers is brought to you 100% independent and ad-free thanks to our dear patrons over on patreon.com slash Gamers to get yourself sweet, sweet perks such as uncut early access to the episodes, special episodes of the podcast, and more. Head on over to patreon.com slash Gamers and consider lending support and joining the herd. Without further ado, let's hop into the show. Hello and welcome, dear listeners, to episode 184 of the Reform Gamers, the show all about theology, video games, and predicting the future. I'm your host, Logan. And I'm his guest host, Micah. Micah, how's it going, man? I'm doing pretty good, Logan. How are you? No, I'm doing I'm doing pretty good. Wishing I had Chick-fil-A, you know, like a like a certain mm. someone here on the show. Had that spicy uh, chicken sandwich before the show. It was real mm. good. Just just that holy chicken, man. It's mm-hmm. just I dream about it sometimes, to be honest. If I'm just being honest, (laughs) Chick-fil-A is just so good. So, so good. Anyway, dear listeners, we have Micah on the show uh, for this episode. We're going to be talking about kind of basically our our predictions for 2021 for Nintendo, Microsoft, PlayStation, and kind of spitballing or brainstorming some of the things that they need to do or some of the things that we hope that they do this year. Adam could not make it because of another uh, well, several ministry engagements. And to be honest, he's kind of starting to make me feel like, 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 should I be stepping it up as a youth pastor? <laughs> He's like so busy with ministry. Makes it seem like that uh, I'm fulfilling this stereotype of youth pastors where we only work one day a week. So I don't know, man. I don't know. But yeah, so he is busy with that. And so he uh, will hopefully be back next episode, Lord willing. Uh, but he is uh, he's out. And so uh, there is that. But we brought, by, brought Micah on our news czar, so to speak, of the website. And so he's going to be able to help us out with this topic. It's going to be awesome. And speaking of topics, really just some things to check out. I'm really bad at segues. Who knew? But a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the show. Uh, Just some new content I do want to make you all aware of, both on the website and YouTube. The Habroxia 2 review is up on both the website and YouTube. Feel free to check that out. I uh, got a review code for that sent over from Liam Smith PR, who apparently are listeners of the show. So thank you for uh, that support, guys. Thank you for that review code. We got the review up uh, pretty much the same day that the game came out, and so you guys should be able to check that out. Uh, I'm just going to tell you right now, just go play the game. Habroxia 2 is a great game. I really, really enjoyed it, especially if you are into retro shmup games. Fantastic game. You can get it on Switch, PC, Xbox, PlayStation, uh, PS Vita, even for those of you that still have a Vita, you can get it on that and enjoy that. Also on the website, there is an interview with one of 500 developer. That's a weird way of phrasing it, but there's a developer making this game called one of 500, where you experience Jesus's ministry as a young fisherman from the start to the end and beyond in a life is strange, episodic format. So you can go check that interview out. Link will be in your show notes. Do you also want to highlight to join our discord because our book club has started for February. We're going to be reading through hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy this month. So if you would like to get in on that, please join the discord server link will be in your show notes and get to reading that book. Cause our first meeting will be on the 15th of this month. It's going to be awesome. I've never read the book before, so I'm, Definitely interested and curious as to what I'm going to be getting into. But as always, links to everything else will be in your show notes. Let's get into the show without further delay. So hello and welcome to the Reform Gamers. We're going to start off the show like we always do with a little bit of what have we been playing. Micah, what have you been getting into, man? Man, I've been playing some games, but real quick, I want to ask, you know, you're talking about that Habroxia 2 review. Mm-hmm. Now, did you did you get that Platinum Trophy? Oh, dude, you know I got that platinum. Okay, so it's got the, your platinum seal of approval then. Oh, 100%. Okay, 100%. just just wanted to make sure. Just wanted to make sure. I, I do want to hear about that briefly when you're talking about your games. It's, but- uh, it's kind of funny because when we got the email uh, for the review code, they were kind of giving us a breakdown of how long uh, it's projected to take to play and beat the game and then to get the platinum. And uh, I saw that it said like 10 hours uh, projected for a platinum. And I was like, challenge accepted. And I got it in five. So I was like, yes. Nice. There we Dude, go. It's super good. There five go. hours. Mm, you're making me so, want to pick it up. All right. Well, anyway, it's $10. It's $10. It's cheap. So. Yeah. I have to go. I have to go look into that. Loved uh, Twin Breaker. Anyway, I have been playing 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. 
Mm, um, I've heard of this game. Yeah, uh, I don't know how much you know about it, Logan, but it is just all the hotness here. It's just gaining momentum since it came out, I think, last September. Um, this is uh, the, the latest game from Vanillaware, who also did uh, Muramasa back in the day and Dragon's Crown. Um, so, oh, they did. Oh, okay. I was wondering why the art looked familiar. So, okay. Dragon's crown. Now I got the connection. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I, I have never played any of their games uh, previously. So this is my first foray into a vanilla or game, but, um, I'm having just a dandy time with 13 Sentinels. It, it's essentially like a 2d adventure, like visual novel. Um, I've got the huge emphasis on sort of, so, so you get the story, through the perspective of these 13, um, you know, high school kids. And so like, there's a big emphasis on like piecing the story together sort of little by little as you get bits and pieces from each of them. So I can go play, um, you know, Juro's story, for example, for a little while and get a piece of it and then bounce out. So you get these little micro bite sized uh, story segments that are like maybe 10 to 20 minutes long a piece so really digestible and then you slowly start to peel back this very complex um time hopping narrative that's going on that's really quite intriguing that's kind of what's got me hooked and then it laces in this rts this real-time strategy element uh, alongside with it where you're in these um big mechs basically fighting kaiju essentially but it's like an rts um so you like there's a like you like, like there's really cool progression with the combat as far as like adding on different armaments and leveling them up and at doing you know buffs and one-time use items and things like that and during combat so you know you have the 13 sentinels the 13 different um sort of robots that you can you know you'll pilots that you can hop into but you can only use six at a time so you have to make your team up and like, like you, gotta, you gotta have like a time for them to rest in between battles and things like that so you have to strategize who you want to use and, and how you want to go about each battle so all that is really kind of you, when you combine that with the story elements it combines to be a really nice package um really cool visual art style um pretty uh, you know, pretty run of the mill, like, you know, Japanese high school sort of backdrop. Um, but, uh, intriguing plot, uh, really good voice acting all throughout every single line of dialogue is voice acted. Um, so, so all that is really well done. So yeah, nice, nice little package here. I'm about probably two thirds of the way through. Um, so yeah, 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim, uh, definite recommendation there. Uh, there is some language, uh, nothing, terrible about on par with something like an uncharted game you know oh, okay um but uh but yeah good 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 uh, game there <clears throat> um next up uh been playing some control ultimate edition uh, which just came out for playstation plus yeah, so i got that yeah um logan you and i did a, an episode a, a spoiler cast on control back in the day um about a year ago or so i guess did i don't we? know yeah, we did. You don't remember that? Oh, we did. Yeah, we did, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. I have a hard time remembering all the stuff that we've recorded. Literally every, <laughs> And I've said this a couple of times. Literally, once we finish recording, I forget everything we've said and everything we've talked about. And so, it's fine. It's fine. The internet's going to remember it for you. So <laughs> there you go. Um, oh, but man, yeah, so, so I oh, was sorry. Go ahead. What were you gonna say? I was just gonna ask you like, so how is it then? How's the upgrades? How does it look? All that stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, kind of going back to the episode, you know, I love control. It's one of my uh, very favorite games from that year. Um, yeah. Great upgrade. This game was made for next gen. You know, of course, if you have a, a great beefy PC, you're already right there enjoying it. But um, for the those that are that have an Xbox Series X or a PS5, um, you've been waiting for this next gen upgrade for Control, and here it is. And yeah, it's got all the ray tracing, all the you know the performance mode, and all that sort of stuff you would want and expect from from uh, the next gen console version. So I'm only just a couple of hours in, so I've just toyed with the the graphics ray tracing mode and then the 60 FPS mode. A little bit of both and man the, the ray tracing is legit at better than uh, miles morales i think oh, um, wow. which is the kind of the, the showcase so far for ps5 um i mean the game's just really beautiful in general um you know there's so many particles flying around everywhere yeah. um so i don't know where i'm gonna settle in yet i'll probably settle in on that 60 fps mode because it's kind of really hard not to especially with a game like control Mm -hmm. um but uh performs well i think there's some dips but nothing major um in performance and just getting back into the oldest house again man that again it, that is i mentioned it probably back on that original episode 
that is such a cool backdrop for for a game like this. Um, one of my very favorite like set pieces for a game in recent memory. Um, yeah. So yeah, all the all the uh, architecture uh, that that is uh, laced throughout all of the oldest house is really cool. So yeah, um, just enjoying control again, all over again through the ultimate edition, and uh, yeah, so that and Thirteen Sentinels is what I've been playing for the most part. Nice. And that Ultimate Edition comes with the DLC for Control, right? Yeah, which I've never dove into Man. before, so I'm I'm eager to dig into that uh, a AWE one for sure. Yeah, that was the thing with that when I saw that it was going on to PS Plus for free and it comes with the DLC. I was like, wait, what? It's like <laughs> you should give us the game with all the DLC. And so I hadn't played the DLC either. Uh, I had picked it up for PC and meant to play it there, and I just never got around to it. So I will definitely be playing it on ps5 especially since i can get some trophies uh, mm-hmm. along with it as well uh, it's one thing i thought i'd be playing more on my pc because of the equipment and the speed and all that stuff but no playstation still has me uh by the trophies and so <laughs> I, I want i want trophies really really bad but as far as what i've been playing uh guys welcome to the dark souls hour of the podcast where i talk about me literally just playing nothing but Dark Souls. I'm kind of kidding when I say this, but uh, since the last episode, I did finish Dark Souls 1. I actually finished that on stream, so if you were there, uh, that I can't remember when it was. It was a couple weeks ago now. Uh, Friday morning, you, you were there when I took down Gwyn, the final boss, and then got a really weird ending, and I, and I still... Actually, I know what happened now, but I'm not going to spend like the 20 minutes to explain it here on the podcast. Um, cool game, man. Cool game. I started up Dark Souls 3 since then. Got to play it with um, one of the listeners, a friend of the show, uh, Dakota, one of our resident Canadians, and uh, and man, it's it's still good. And man, Dark Souls is way more fun with friends than it is just doing it solo. There's this hundred percent. Yeah, there's this tension, right, of playing it by yourself. And you're like, man, I feel so cool because I'm taking down these bosses by myself. You know, I feel powerful as a gamer. But then when you bring a friend in, it's you know, I recorded Happy Souls uh, last episode, and it is literally like that little animated video on YouTube where we're just goofing off and getting into hijinks and things like that. We actually, when we first started playing together, the first three times we linked up, we kept getting invaded by other players, and we yep. kept getting double teamed. And I'm like, "Yep, this is. I guess this is the full Dark Souls experience here." So. Uh, here it is but it's great for those who have played dark souls 3 we just beat the uh abyss watchers fight which is the uh characters who if you're familiar with dark souls lore it they're i think they were trained by artorius who was a super fast boss in the dark souls 1 dlc and these guys are pretty much like you fight i think three or four of them at a time if you don't take one down uh, quick enough and man it's Ah, the Abyss Watchers are so cool looking, and the fight is so cool on top of that, that I'm like, how can this game get any cooler? Yeah. I don't think it can, but <laughs> people are telling me that, that it does. The fights just get better. And So is I, that was that your first time beating Dark Souls 1? Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And, yep. so, Feels but, good. and so you're playing 3 now. Have you beaten that one before? No, I've never beaten that. So I, I went about this series in a really weird way, right? So... On PS4, when Bloodborne came out, that's the first one I played and beat, and that's what kind of got me introduced into that whole genre. And then after that, I was like, you know, I kind of like Bloodborne the more I think about it. I I should probably try and play the Dark Souls games, and Dark Souls 3 hadn't come out yet. So I went and picked up the Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin edition on PS4, played and beat that, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. But at the time, Dark Souls Remastered hadn't come out. And so I was like, fine, I'll just go play Dark Souls 3. Never really got around to it. And then uh, picked up Dark Souls 1, played that on and off for, I mean, years since it came out on both Switch and and PlayStation. But then I got sidetracked by Code Vein and Sekiro, and I only beat Code Vein. Sekiro drove me nuts. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so I've been playing these games completely out of order. uh, And so I've just been uh, trying trying to fix that a little bit. And so hopefully, uh, not hopefully I know I'm going to beat dark souls three. Like I just, I'm hooked on it at this point. There's no not finishing it for me at this point. Very cool. And so, yeah, man, dark souls, I'm loving it. It got to the point where I found the soundtracks on Spotify was listening to those at work. <laughs> nice. And so, 
that made studying and prepping for Wednesday nights as a youth pastor just completely epic. I was about to say super epic. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, man, I feel like I need to I need to fight this this Bible study here and like win. <laughs> but been so I did that. I found that there were there were two books uh, that cover the development history of uh, Demon Souls and Dark Souls is one book, and then the next book covers. Uh, I think like Dark Souls 2 and 3 and Bloodborne is in there somewhere. So I'm like, I'm just going to read these because that just hooked. Yeah. And so yeah, I thought about buying some statues of the different characters from the games too. But then I saw that they're like over $1,000 on eBay. And I'm like, never mind. I'll just, I'll just play the games. I'll just play the games. <laughs> quick, quick, um, quick point about um, the multiplayer. You're absolutely right though about like that sort of adding an element to, to having a buddy playing with you. I recently played through Demon Souls uh, remake on PS5 mm-hmm. and was going through the first I don't know, three, four, five, you know, levels and, you know, doing it by myself. And then my brother-in-law, Brett, uh, hopped in with me and it just like breathed new life into the game for both of us. And we like finished out the whole thing together, more or less. Yeah. yeah. Just super duper good with, 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 if you have a buddy there. Absolutely. It's just, it's one of those things where it just really enhances the experience in, mm-hmm. in, in a couple different ways. So, and then the last game I'll talk about, I did play the demo for Resident Evil Village, which is kind of more of a technical showcase that's only out on the PS5 right now. And it got to a point where me and my wife were playing it. And I really, I had her play it after I played it because I wanted to see what her reactions were. And we just kind of made fun of it the entire time and made jokes. And I was like, this is hilarious. I should have recorded this and put it on YouTube, but I didn't do that. So now I'm like, let's play Resident Evil 7 and do the same thing there. And so I had her start playing that. And she was just like, I'm not really feeling the aesthetic of this game. This whole swamp Bayou stuff with, you know, these kind of like quote unquote hillbilly bad guys. I don't know how I feel about this. And so she got to the boss fight with, um, the, uh, the guy in the garage. I can't remember what his name is. I know it's like Baker or something. Anyway, so she was fighting him. Couldn't really figure it out. I know what to do. So she handed me the controller and I wound up basically playing through the entire game in an afternoon on a Saturday. Whoa. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, I was like, Hey, I know what to do. I'm just going to keep going. And I, before I knew it, I'm like, Oh, I'm done with the game. Oh, so Super good. <laughs> fun fact. You can beat that game in five and a half hours. Uh, there's also a trophy for beating it in under four hours. So I guess you can, if you That's really Resident know Evil, man. Speed run it. Yeah. You know about those Resident Evil speed runs? Oh, I do. I, I did it like two or three times on Resident Evil 3. And so I think, actually, I think my Inferno run is on uh, TRG's YouTube channel. So people nice. can go check that out if you want. I think I did that in under two hours, if I remember correctly. But anyway, so that just got me into this Resident Evil mood. And so I was like, well, dude, I'd never played the DLC. So I downloaded all the DLC and played through Chris Redfield's DLC and was like, ah, oh, snap. Let's just keep it going. How how is that DLC? I mean, do you like it? It's so, hmm. How do I describe that DLC? It's okay. Like, it it definitely feels more like classic Resident Evil, and it's probably just because you're playing as Chris Redfield. But it was, I don't know, it was this weird blend of, like, Metroidvania, where you had to, like, collect certain items to open up certain areas of this cave you're exploring. But you still had, like, the feel of Resident Evil where... Like you're going through like these creepy areas, you're fighting zombies or I guess in this, it's the mold, but I didn't really understand. I didn't understand how this content existed because the guy that you're chasing after, I thought died during the events of resident evil seven, but he shows up in the DLC. So that really confused me, but Mm, okay. Anyway, but I I thought it was fine. I I looked at some of the reviews online and people apparently didn't really like it a whole lot, but I was like, I enjoyed it. You know, it gave me more background and context to kind of what the heck is going on. And if Umbrella is active, if the BSAA is still active, um, but I'll let people play that DLC and and figure it out for themselves. Yeah, I definitely want to go back and play seven again, probably here pretty soon to to get ready for eight, since it seems like they're tied together in some way, at least. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. And I, I wasn't going to do this with this game when I first played. I mean, when I first played Resident Evil 7, I didn't like it because it was too violent. And then I played it and then beat it and was like, okay, I kind of enjoyed it. I mean, there's more Resident Evil. Yeah. And now I'm like, after I beat it uh, this past weekend, I was like, I could beat this game in under four hours. Why don't I just go for the platinum while I'm at it? So Ooh. I think mm. I might, I think I might be going for the platinum on Resident Evil 7. 
Dude, we'll if see. you do that, that would be very inspiring for me. I would definitely go back to seven and I might I might do that. The only thing I'm nervous wanders. about is playing Madhouse difficulty because they change up from what I've heard, they change up a lot of stuff from where the enemy placements are to uh, like the harder boss, the harder fight, the harder enemies that you fight later in the game actually show up way earlier in the game and they move like where all the items are placed and where all the coins are. And so I'm like, hmm, that's oh, cool, man. So cool. I mean, it, it ma- makes it worth playing. That's for sure. I wish they gave out a trophy for playing through it in VR because that's what I did the first playthrough, which was freaking scary. <laughs> Wait, you played the entire thing in VR? Yeah. For, on PSVR. It was so Brave man. good. Right, man. Um, but yeah, Adele, it, it was almost like I didn't want to play, but I kind of did <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> at yeah, the yeah. same time. <laughs> no, I, I get that. I understand that. But yeah, so Resident Evil 7, man, I uh, might go for the platinum on it. I don't know. We'll see. But I uh, I already pre-ordered Resident Evil 8, like, because <laughs> it, was, it was funny because my wife was telling me like a few days after she had played the demo, she was like, I can't stop thinking about that demo. I'm really excited about that game. If you wanted to pre-order mm-hmm. it, I would not be mad. And I'm like, okay. So I pre-ordered the deluxe edition. I don't think she okayed the deluxe Super edition, but good. I was like, <laughs> I was like, let's get the extras. Let's see, you know, let's get the yeah. soundtrack and the, and the weapon charm and yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff that will hopefully make the game easier for me. <laughs> so, but oh, yeah, man, so I'm, I'm gonna be hyped. I'm so excited, man. I will say this. Okay, a little mild tangent. Not tangent, really, but just a little footnote. The whole obsession with Lady Dimitris, however you pronounce her name, flipping weird, man. Yeah. Things are getting weird. Markiplier, I see you, dude. I watched that video of you freaking out about it. It's It's a little weird. I think we all need to go hose ourselves off or something. Chill out a little bit. Yeah, I think it's you just you just don't talk about it, don't give it attention, it'll go away soon enough. <laughs> that's probably yeah, that's probably I just realized I probably just kicked a hornet's nest and now <laughs> we're gonna get flooded with memes and stuff on Twitter. So kinda like kinda like that article we put out and it just exactly. invited a bunch of a bunch of things in the Facebook group. <laughs> oh man. Anyway, speaking of let's just do um, switching gears. <laughs> Michael, what have you been reading? Been reading some good stuff, man. Um no, for real. I've been reading, um, it's going to sound like an echo from the last couple of episodes. I think Adam's been talking about it uh, gentle and lowly by Dane Ortland. Wait, um, wait, wait, is this Adam speaking right now? Is he speaking through Micah? Oh, oh sorry. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, man, this, <laughs> no, this, this book is just, it's making the rounds right now. Um, I, I've noticed that for, for, for good reason. It, it's a really, really great read. I'm, I'm still pretty early into it, but, um, one point I wanted to highlight out of it, um, that I read recently in chapter three talks about sort of, well, well, first off, just real quick, if you haven't heard, it's sort of, um, examines the heart of Christ. The whole book examines the heart of Christ through the lens of Matthew 11, uh, 28, 28 through 31, you know, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest, um, all that. And, and so, uh, chapter three is looking at the, the happiness of Christ and it goes into the story right here. I want to read from the book. A compassionate doctor has traveled deep into the jungle to provide medical care to a primitive tribe afflicted with a contagious disease. He has had his medical equipment flown in. He has correctly diagnosed the problem and the antibiotics are prepared and available. He is independently wealthy and he has no need for any kind of financial compensation, but he seeks to provide care. The afflicted, excuse me, but as he seeks to provide care, the afflicted refuse they want to take the care they want to take care of themselves they want to heal on their own terms finally a few brave young men step forward to receive the care being freely provided what does the doctor feel joy his joy increases to the degree that the sick come to him for help and healing it's the whole reason he came and then skip over it says when you come to christ for mercy and love and help in your anguish and perplexity and, sinful, and sinfulness. You are going uh, with the flow of his own deepest wishes, not against them. To put it another way around, when we hold back, lurking in the shadows, fearful and failing, we miss out not only on our own increased uh, comfort, but on uh, but on Christ's increased comfort. He lives for this. This is what he loves to do. His joys, his joy, and, and ours rise and fall together. Um, so I just liked that sort of illustration of, of the doctor going in and, and just sort of the joy and happiness Christ derives through 
meeting us where we are, um, outpouring mercy and love on us. And, you know, it's so, it's a struggle to, you know, approach a holy God, especially if you've maybe been in sin recently or, or what have you, but that's where he loves to meet you. That literally gives him joy. So, um, just great reminders laced throughout this whole book. I can't recommend it enough. I'm only just a handful of chapters in and it's, and it's really, really good so far. So, um, don't want to spend too much time on it. I know Adam's talked about it, but yeah, a gentle and lowly by Dane Ortland. Really, really good. Yeah. I, uh, I have that book in my queue on my Kindle to read, uh, for this year. So I am looking forward to, I mean, all I hear are great things, uh, about it. So, and just even listening to that just reminds me of one of my favorite verses in, uh, first John two, one, where John's telling people he's writing to, Hey, you know, I write, I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin. But if you do remember, we have an advocate in the father, Jesus Christ. And it's just one of those things where it's an encouragement to go to him, you know, cause it's, it's not one of those things where he's going to like, you know, blow up on you or anything. He's like, no, nah, I'm going to dust you off, forgive you. And you know, tell you to go sin no more. It's one of those cool things. Um, that's good. Uh, as far as what I've been reading, I've been going through uh, Tim Keller's Counterfeit Gods. It's just part of my overall study of idols and teaching that to my students. And it's been really good. It's definitely been uh, a pretty difficult read in a few uh, chapters. And I've been kind of reading through the one where he's talking about just kind of like pride and power, pride and power, pride and power. <laughs> words are hard. And uh, he's just talking about how like really pride really screws you up and, and how it really messes with you and things of that nature. Uh, he's kind of going over the story of Nebuchadnezzar and how he was really uh, thirsting for power and, and things of that nature and, and how it was really leading to his ruin. And he had those dreams and Daniel was the only one that could interpret them. And so he's going into that whole uh, story in the Bible. But there's this quote that he that I highlighted and shared on Twitter that just kind of is a good gut check uh, for a lot of us that are both pastors, content creators, just people in general, uh, even if you're a layman uh, in church serving your church. Uh, he says to be your own God and live your own glory or live for your own glory and power. It leads to the most bestial and cruel kind of behavior. Pride makes you a predator, not a person. And it just kind of got me thinking about how, you know, we talked in the pre-show about how me and my wife have been watching Dexter and you see that being played out in um, the, one of the characters in season three, his name's uh, uh, Miguel. And like, you see it, that in embodied in that character right there where he he doesn't act like a person with a soul really he acts like a, a predator a, a just truly evil incarnate where he is charming people left and right he's manipulating people to get his way and it is it's really uncomfortable to watch it's very unsettling and and Tim Keller is talking about, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is being kind of the same way. And, and it's this dream that God gives him. Uh, so Daniel can come in that really just trips him up and man, it, it's a good encouragement, uh, but it's been a good gut check for myself as well, especially when it comes to, you know, doing this podcast or doing content creation, because it's very easy to start doing this stuff with the intentions of glorifying myself and, uh, doing it to where I get the praise instead of giving that to God. And it's been, it, this has been a, a hard chapter. I'm not going to lie, but it's been a good chapter because it's got me to, you know, come to grips with that and really just ask myself some uh, honest questions and some hard questions and kind of put things back into perspective for me, which has been super helpful. Cause I think that, especially us as pastors, it's real easy to fall into this trap of trying to do things. And then when people say like, you know, Oh dude, that was such a good sermon or whatever kind of praise we may get, it's easy to accept that and just go, you know what? Yeah. I'm, I'm doing this for, for, for the praise of it. You know, I'm going to accept that, but uh, that's, that's not, that's not what God would have for us. So it's been good. I've, been really, um, like I said, in the last episode, it's been, I've been enjoying this time of really wrestling with, you know, what are some idols in my life? What are the underlying idols of those that if I just got rid of the surface level ones, you know, what are the ones that I really need to be digging deep and getting rid of? And, uh, it's been, it's been good. It's been good. I've been really enjoying the season of life. So that is 
what I have been reading. Now, before we switch gears here and get into the topic of the show, just a quick reminder to rate and review the show on your podcast app of your choice, whether that's on podchaser.com or iTunes or uh, the Google Play Store, any one of those, go ahead and leave a rating and review for the show because that helps us out in a long way, helps us out in a long way, helps us out in a good way. It just helps us out. You get the idea because uh, with podcasts, there's no algorithms, so you kind of have to leave the rating and review and that helps us move around on the charts. So 2021 is an interesting year for us as gamers. We are full speed ahead into a new generation of consoles. We've got a slew of games coming out here in the coming months and later on in the year even. And there's some games we're still not very sure if they're even going to come out this year. But that's not going to stop us from guessing at what these companies are going to do this year and maybe do some wishful thinking. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Your future hasn't been written yet. No one's has. Your future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one. Basically, what we're going to do during this section here, dear listeners, is go over each of the big three, starting with Xbox and just talking about Some of the predictions that we think they're going to make, maybe some games they're going to release this year, some games they're going to push back, things of those nature, things of those nature, Eh, words are hard, but that's what we're going to talk about uh, during the section here. So at any point during this section, feel free to hop onto Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and type in your predictions uh, on the post that you see of this episode. If you're listening to this on YouTube, do the same thing down there in the comments. We'd love to see what some, what things you think Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo are going to do this year. If they're going to push any games back, if they're going to release any new hardware, things like that. So without further ado, let's start off with Xbox. Now, I personally think, in my humble opinion, Xbox is off to a pretty decent start in my opinion, for the year. They just dropped the medium, which is getting, you know, not like amazing, mind-blowing reviews, but it's getting good reviews, and you can play it on uh, Game Pass if you want to try it out for yourself. And, of course, they have the Xbox Series X out. They have the Xbox Series S. They have xCloud that they're working on. Uh, And I think it's... Is xCloud xCloud officially released yet, or is that still in, like, a beta? I believe it's still in beta, but do not quote me on that, man. I'm, I'm not sure. Fair enough. Fair enough. Man, I brought you on because I thought you were the news guy. You're supposed to know all these I'm things. I'm sorry. Micah. I'm sorry. I'm just not I'm not plugged into the X Cloud. But yeah, I think it's still <sighs> in beta, I believe. All right, fair enough. That's okay. Steven will correct us if we're wrong. So let's just start off with Xbox, man. What are what is what is kind of ping pong back and forth? What's something you think Xbox is going to do in twenty twenty one? You know, um, I had a bit of a hard time with Xbox in particular uh, trying to trying to figure out. But I think one safe thing, one safe bet you can say is that they're going to acquire more studios. Um, that is something that I think Phil Spencer has said in the past that they're still looking to do. Um, and they obviously went on the big sort of buying spree a couple of years ago when they um, got uh, developers like Obsidian and um and double fine and things like that and then obviously the big one was bethesda uh, just a few months ago so i don't think they're done i think they're gonna have more uh more studio acquisitions to announce something more medium size not anything to the size of bethesda uh, but you know they they're they're focused on bringing content to games pass and um, you know what better way to do that than to than to, than to bring in some of these some of these developers and make it exclusive to the platform or at least first on that platform and best on that platform and that sort of thing. So I'm seeing more studio acquisitions in Microsoft's future. Yeah, I think I think I can see that too. It's just it's I think that's going to just be a common thing we'll see this year. I mean, after they bought uh, Bethesda recently, it's kind of like who else who else are they? are they looking at, you know? So it's, it's one of those things where you just keep an eye out. Cause I think that I think they're going to buy some more studios also. Um, as far as what I think Xbox is going to do in 2021. And as much as it pains me to say this, I really think halo infinite is going to get pushed back again. Micah, I, you are I not. have a bad feeling that game is not in a good spot and we're not going to see it this year. 
Um, so I know that that's is controversial. I know that's probably going to upset some people, but I just, I don't have a good feeling about it right now. You know, I've been wrong before, you know, my, wow. fe- my that, feelings are not, that, that's a little surprising. Be- Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just think that, you know, they pushed it back technically a year, I guess, and since they were going to try to hit the launch um, late in 2020 originally. And man, a year is a good chunk of change to delay a game that you can get a lot done in a year. Um, now, if there were pivotal changes to the game, yeah, maybe I can see it not not hitting the date, but... I'm going to I'm just just to sort of, you know, offer a different take. I'm going to disagree with that. I think is it will sur- I think it has to come out this year. I don't think it has a choice. But uh but I like that hot take for sure. That is I I I guess I could see it happening. I wouldn't be shocked. But man, I think it needs to hit this year. Oh, I think it needs to hit too. Like I don't think they can afford to delay it, but I think it's going to happen. You know, I was I was listening to um uh, I can't remember which podcast it was, but uh, it was one of Colin Moriarty's podcasts. It was either on Sacred Symbols or Defining Duke. And they were talking about how, you know, that game was supposed to launch last year and we never saw a beta. And I'm like, hmm. oh, that's a really good point, you know? And so it kind of has me thinking if that game was supposed to release last year, where is the beta? Because they always test the multiplayer servers and kind of get a stress test and go through all that. Where Where's that at? So yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, Probably should have started off with something a little more positive. Like, no, I don't like no, what that's you did. Fine. Well, well, <laughs> here's, <laughs> well, here's something positive. I'll, I've got a couple more, but I'm going to say this one because this is more outrageous and it's way more positive. Okay. Xbox is going to bring back Summer of Arcade Game oh, Pass dude. Edition. Dude. So, there, you know, I think Summer of Arcade, I don't know how long it lasted, but it was really kind of 2009, 10, 11 in that era where you, they would release a new, generally indie, kind of smaller, cheaper title every week for a month in the middle of the summer. And there are always just five, like four, five, or six just banging titles. And I want them to bring that back. That was always such a cool, uh, you could always just bank on some of Arcade having some really quality titles in it. So I think they're going to bring that back under, maybe not the exact same name, but something like that, that, that you know... <laughs> harkens back to that same feeling and it's going to be a game pass sort of way. Like they're going to, you know, just have it out there in game pass or something like that, but they're going to bring back some of arcade. That's what I think. All right. I I like that. I like that. Take a lot. I dude, I remember when I had an Xbox 360 and I always looked forward to the summer of arcade. Like, cause you would get some really, I mean, you got castle crashers in that. You got braid through that. You got, um, yeah, God, I think Salt and Sanctuary dropped during then. Yeah, I think you had Super Meat Boy during the summer. Like, yep. you would get so many really great indie games. And it was just, oh man, it was such a cool. I think Scott Pilgrim even dropped during the summer of arcade. And like, oh man, oh man, what a good, good summer. Oh, man. Limbo was one. I'm looking at a list, not Bastion, That's right. summer of arcade originally. Oh, yeah. Um, Man. Yeah, some really good ones. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows. Oh wait, that's never mind. That's not yeah. one of the good ones. I thought that I was, was one of the two D ones. <laughs> Take that back. <laughs> Rewind that. Uh, I remember. I remember getting that game and being super stoked for it. And I played. It, I'm like, this stinks. I don't like this. <laughs> like this is horrible. Oh man. Abort. Abort. <laughs> Poor Ninja Turtles, man. They can't catch a break. Um. Okay, so let me go on to, to one of my other takes. Um, I, so this is one that frustrated me as as a Apple iPhone user when I first heard the news that xCloud was not coming to iPhones because of some weird thing with Apple and it was competing with their Apple Arcade, even though people forget that Apple even does the arcade thing multiple times. And I think something's going to happen this year where Xbox is going to work something out where they get xCloud onto iPhones. Again, this is probably just wishful thinking on my part, but I think that there's going to be enough of a push from Apple users who want xCloud on their iPhone that Apple is going to concede and be like, fine, we'll, we'll let it happen. And, uh, and we'll see xCloud hit the iPhones. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is, yeah, I like that one. I think that one has a good chance of happening for sure. Um, 
and yeah, that would just that that I think Microsoft really needs that to sort of fit along with all those plans and stuff. You know, as much as some people like to groan about the Apple ecosystem, the number of iPhones out there can't be denied, and they need that market um, to to help accomplish the goals that Microsoft has set out for that. So, so yeah, I think they'll make that happen this year as well for sure. Yeah, man. So what um, about you? Are there any others that you can think of? Well, for I've, got, I've got one more. For, I don't have three for all of them, but I do for Microsoft. Okay. My last one okay. here that I'll mention is, um, and I may have mentioned this in past years, I feel like they're always on the verge of doing this, but I feel like it's a good year with the new hardware out to, to go ahead and pull the trigger. Um, they're not going to make their own VR headset, but they are going to partner with some other headsets currently out there. So like maybe the Vive or the Oculus or whatever else, they're going to make it to where you can hook up a VR headset to an Xbox Series X or S. And um and roll with it and yeah they're gonna jump into the VR space I think so um not a whole lot of extra commentary there that's just it's pretty cut and dry yeah. um it's not something that they have to do um but I think it will be cheap enough and worthwhile enough to go ahead and and to jump into those waters with a third party relationship like that gotcha gotcha right on I uh so for this last one, like I'm trying to, like I could easily go for the low hanging fruit and say, they're going to release Forza Horizon five this year. It's like, no, duh. They like that. <laughs> like out of all the things that we're predicting right here, that one probably has like a 99.9% chance of happening, you know, yeah. aside from them buying another studio. But I think kind of what I want to do with this one is, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like what Xbox exclusive because they, they have this. How about this, um? How about Hellblade Two? No. Senua Saga. Okay. No. What What I'm thinking is like because uh, you know they have this this tendency to release uh, exclusives that were on their platform to the Nintendo Switch, and I'm trying to think of another one that they could port over. I don't, oh, I don't really, <laughs> not Hellblade. <laughs> no, no. I mean Hellblade is on the Switch, which kind of blows my mind that it's on there. Uh, and it runs as well as it does, but I'm trying to think. I uh, I don't see the medium coming over to it. Um, I just think that that's maybe a little too much for the Switch. But I don't know. I feel like we're gonna see more Xbox Studio games. How about something like Grounded. I could see that coming to Switch. Yeah. yeah, I could see that coming to Switch pretty easily, or even PlayStation because. I mean, it, you look at both kind of what what Xbox and PlayStation is doing now. You have MLB The Show coming to Xbox, uh, mm-hmm. I think, this year, which is mind-blowing to see, like, a PlayStation Studio game in a green box. Like, I like what even is this year <laughs> already? Yeah. Uh, and so I think that, especially with Xbox and how they're releasing games on the Switch and they later come to PlayStation I feel like we're going to see some more of those games come over and my hopeful, like wishful thinking would be like Forza Horizon, but I I don't think they, I think that would be stupid for them to port that over to something else. Like you have your kind of landmark, so to speak, racing franchise. You want to keep that on your system, but I I feel like we're going to see some, some Xbox games uh, hit other platforms, especially when you see kind of like what Fortnite did with how they put Kratos in there and master chief. Yeah. It makes me think like, could halo drop on PlayStation or the switch? That would be really weird. Or maybe something like sea of thieves, maybe potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would even be pretty good, which that game has just blown up in popularity Mm -hmm. uh, over the last few years. You know, a lot of people were playing that's pretty active player base. And I think something like that would probably fit the switch pretty well, in my opinion. Yeah. I probably won't name a game specifically, but I feel like we're going to see another Xbox exclusive go to another platform or being be ported over. Um, I don't know what it'll be, but I think I think we'll see it. So yeah. But that being said, that's the Xbox portion. Those are some of our predictions there. If you guys have some predictions for Xbox, drop those into the comments on YouTube or hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all those fun places. Um, so let's switch. Let's let's do Nintendo last. Let's go to PlayStation next. What are some things that you think PlayStation is going to do this year? Um, I'll, I'll save one of these for later. This isn't something PlayStation is going to do so much, but I think um, 
I think 2021, it's going to be uh, hard to find the hardware still. You're, you're, you're not going to find, it's not yeah. going to be easy to find the hardware in 2021, period. And yeah. this may go for the Series X as well, um, with just the shortages and parts and everything that's going around right now at, at, as of time of recording. So, so yeah, not really something Sony's doing. I'm just going to say, like, good luck getting a PS5, I guess, and a Series <laughs> yeah. X. Um, if you think it's frustrating now, that might just continue throughout the rest of the year. Um, maybe when the holidays come back around, then, um, they'll have some good stock that you'll be able to bank on one, you know, but, you know, you know, obviously you can, um, find one before then, but I just think it's still going to be tough sledding if you're looking to just walk into a store and find one. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree with that. I think they even came out and said like, it's it, like the shortages and maybe you brought this up again. Again, when we're recording, my brain just goes into 10 different places. And so I miss things a lot. But, you know, uh, and you may have said this, but like they have come out and said that they think the shortages are going to last until June. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's it's going to be hard to get one of these. But, you know, stay vigilant, um, you know, stay patient and things like that. And I know some people in our community on the Facebook group at least have been trying to help each other try to uh, secure PlayStations and Xboxes. And Mm -hmm. uh, they've been pretty successful for some people. And so um, it's worked out. So I... And maybe this is another episode. This is a bit of a side conversation. But Micah, you have a PS5 right now, right? Yeah. So let me get your thoughts on this. And again, this is probably just totally out of place. But hey, bonus content. <laughs> do you think it's do you think it's worth upgrading to a PS5 right now for those that are on PS4? Um probably not. Yeah, and that is not something I would usually say. Um, it, it, people that know me, I know, um, you know, Logan. You know, I'm an early adopter when it comes to this sort of stuff, especially oh, yeah. with PlayStation. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's kind of with the way that they've done it this, this year, this generation. Um, their biggest game, Miles Morales, is available on PS4. Um, it looks like games such as Ratchet and Clank are going to be on PS4. Resident Evil 8 is going to be on PS4. So if you're content with with what you're getting there and, you know, you don't have 500 bucks to shell out or you just can't find one, you're you're not missing out on anything but some bells and whistles. Yeah. Um, now, does that discount the quality of something like the DualSense controller? No, not at all. It's a fantastic mm-hmm. controller. Um, but if you're if you're just trying to find a reason to get one, then I would say just wait, you know, if you, you know, you, you, I think you know who you are, if you're really, really wanting one and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, this, you know, they'll only improve things, um, maybe come out with a slim version. If you're really going to wait a few years, that sort of thing. So yeah, I wouldn't think there's any, um, any super need to dive in right now, unless you're just want to be on the bleeding edge. Yeah. Which is totally fine too. That's me. That, that, that is me. So, so yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah. I'm the same way. I was just thinking about that the other day. I'm like, man, like, I don't, I just don't think there's really like a good solid reason right now to, to upgrade to, to either of these new consoles really. Um, but it's just one of those things where like, and that's kind of why we're doing this episode, you know, kind of predicting these things. Cause if, if these companies hit these and, and make these certain things happen, it'll definitely be worth upgrading and i think i mean that kind of goes into um my thing i'm probably not going to answer this i'll save it for a youtube video i guess um but i think you know we you mentioned how spider-man miles morales was on ps4 it's on ps5 and they've confirmed that horizon zero dawn 2 is going to be on ps4 ps5 and i think they said that god of war like the next one is going to be ps4 ps5 is that right i don't think they've officially said that but okay. um, and we might get into it in just a little bit uh, th- that is my prediction that it will be a ps4 game as well yeah that is one of them see i was actually going to make the prediction and, say, and this was going to be the game where they break that off and say this is going to be a ps5 exclusive it well, won't come to ps4 I, I guess we can go ahead and just use that as a segue to get into it the reason i, I think that is because back when god of war came out in 2018 and and cory barlog did a fantastic sort of marketing um uh blitz during that time and he did so many interviews and and one of them he was talking about how they really wanted to crank out the sequel quicker like way quicker than they did oh okay and how i think they were talking about using or leveraging you know the assets and some of the things they've already built 
in this game. So not saying it's like, you know, all in the same world or anything like that, but just I think they're going to build on some of the foundation. So, for example, God of War 2 or God of War Ragnarok might be kind of like from God of War 1 to God of War 2, the old ones back in the day, as far as gameplay wise. It's very similar is what I'm saying. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, so for those reasons, and Corey saying that back in the day, I and, and, and the fact that they, you know, Sony went ahead and revealed it, and no one thought it was coming soon. They said, "Yep, this year." I still think people are skeptical about that, but yeah, I think that was their desire to crank that bad boy out really quickly because that because they Sony Santa Monica has another game brewing. I'm almost positive mm. after, after God of War, but anyway, yeah. Okay, well, fair enough. I'm gonna hold to it still. Just because if it happens, I can be like, ha, I get a point, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so with that being said, and, and we don't have to count this as like an actual prediction, but like, what do we think that, what's what do we think? What? Wow. I can't talk. Uh, you know, <laughs> words are hard. What game do we think they are developing apart from God of War Ragnarok? I do I don't know. I think a lot of people are looking at Sony for like, what are you doing in the first person shooter department? It looks mm-hmm. like Gorilla is probably going to go back to that and, and do something with um, with Killzone or just maybe a whole new shooter. So I don't know if they're going to if Sony Santa Monica is, is going to make a shooter. I don't know what it is. I think the sky's the limit, you know, sort of like how Sucker Punch went from infamous to Ghost of Tsushima. It's like no one knew that they were working on Ghost or what that would even be, and and it was awesome. So I think it's going to be something like that, just a whole brand new franchise, not God of War. Goodness, they've been making them for decades now. Mm -hmm. Um, Give them something else to make. Um, I know they had a scrapped game back in the day that was supposed to be, they got deep into development with, but um, yeah, there's, there's something else brewing there at Santa Monica. So I think they're trying to get God of War out really quickly here early in the um, PS5 era. Okay. Now I was looking at some of the games that Sony Santa Monica has made. What are the chances you think we'll see a sequel to the order 1886? Um, well, you know, that was actually ready at dawn and Santa Monica assisted, I believe. Yeah. Ready at dawn made that, but Sony still does own the order IP. I'm almost positive. And I know that some fans clamor for it. I wouldn't be shocked to see it. Um, I think, you know, the story element was the strong point of that game. Um, and the lore and all that sort of stuff, the characters, um, and like the, just the design and everything of the world, um, was pretty cool. But yeah, that was already at Dawn game actually, who was, who was, um, they were in the news recently. Are they defunct now or got bought by someone? I can't remember. Oh, I don't know. Um, but, but, but either way, yeah, Sony does own the order, uh, 1886 IP though. So they can do something with it technically. Fair enough. Fair enough. Cool. So what's another uh, prediction you have uh, for? Yeah. So, so here's a juicy one. Um, the rumors have been swirling. So this is kind of a two parter. Okay. Um, Silent Hill is happening and it's coming really? this year. Yeah. It's coming in 2021. I think the rumors are, are too much to deny. Um, and so, so of course uh, I could see this happening. So you got a state of play. I don't know when it is in like June or whatever. And they show it. And then not only do they show up, but they say 2021, it's coming this year. And everyone starts freaking out. And they're like, wait a second, Silent Hill. So that means Konami. And so they go ahead on that very same state of play. They re- they do a teaser for a Metal Gear Solid remake by Blue Point for like later on some, sometime in next year or something like that down the road. But we're going to get two Konami franchises exclusive to PS5. Um, being revamped in Silent Hill will be the first one. Metal Gear Solid Remake will be the second one. That's what I think. I'd be okay with that. I will happily take a Metal Gear Solid remake yeah. a whole mile Yeah, if we don't, if they don't come out this year, which that would be wild, um, they will be. They will both be announced this year. I think. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I think I think for my next one, and this is just because kind of going off of what you said about rumors swirling around, and really the studio has been teasing this for over a year now. I think a new resistance is going to get announced, and at the same Ooh. time, we're going to get a resistance collection Ooh. on uh, PS4 and PS5. Give it to me. So, Ooh, I'll gobble that up. I would too. I would too. I, I would love to play that series because I've always heard so many good things about it and I've never gotten to play it. But it seems like it would be a series I would really like. It seems like that would be 
the PlayStation equivalent to Halo um, for that I would really get into. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I saw just the other day Benji Sales on Twitter put up a poll about which would you rather see uh, Sony revive, the Resistance or the Killzone franchise, and Resistance won by 61%. Yeah. Well, and that that's not surprising. I love that franchise. Just just give us what we want, Sony. Just give it to us. Yeah. Just give it to yeah. us. But as far as predictions go, do you have any others uh for PlayStation? Um no, just that no actual predictions. I think Sony's going to be that they're focused on exclusives for the PS5. So you're going to see more of that like Final Fantasy 16, that's an exclusive. It whether it may be timed or whatever, but you know, it's mm-hmm. th- that that's that's just they're, so you're going to be seeing more of that sort of stuff. Um I think down the road when they reveal um PSVR2, I think Resident Evil 8 is going to be exclusively on that platform um in VR. You know, th- things like that. Um so right. there's going to be a lot of exclusives coming to the system. <clears throat> You know, obviously first party, but third party as well, and things like Final Fantasy VII and other things we don't know about, such as probably Silent Hill. Um, so yeah, I think they're just going to have an exclusive uh, focus. Like they, they're they're going to double down on that, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, right. That's sort of been their strategy here for a little while, but they're just going to double down on that and try to try to drive that uh, software drum. Yeah. And then by the time we get all those, you know, and hopefully by then it'll be uh, easy enough to get a PS5. I mean, people will be like, you know, looking for stuff to play. And so I think that'll give give us a lot to look forward to. So let's round this out. Let's finish with Nintendo. Dear listeners, I hope you are ready for my 20 minute rant to Nintendo <laughs> about Metroid Prime. And all things Metroid, so buckle up because I am going to be yelling. I'm not. I'm kidding. I'm not going to be yelling at Nintendo for this one. But Nintendo, let's be honest. Who would have thought Nintendo would have made as big of a comeback as they have in the Switch? This thing, even just the first few months here in 2021, they're already starting off strong with the Super Mario 3D Land and the Bowser's Revenge. Uh, add on with that it's going to be amazing or i hope it's going to be amazing i probably shouldn't <laughs> speak before i play it you know and then you have monster hunter arise coming out in march which i have played the demo and i've already pre-ordered because i'm like just give me more monster hunter are you kidding me that demo was amazing <laughs> and so it, it's kind of like the sky's the limit at this point you know what are they going to do in 2021 micah tell us um, I know there's a lot of excitement for the the Switch Pro or Switch Two or whatever. Um, you know, for, and and for good reason. You know, the Switch is it is on a trajectory to be the most successful Nintendo console ever, um, if you can call it a console. I guess you know it's a hybrid, obviously. Um, but it's, it's selling like like gangbusters, man. I was just you know the the patrons got a little treat earlier in the show. I was looking at some sales numbers for. Um, for Nintendo, they were talking about their top 10 best-selling games, um, you know, lifetime for switch and like animal crossing, for example, is their number two best-selling game ever on the switch at $31 million at at 31 million units. And, um, that just came out less than a year ago. (laughs) So, you know, if they can, if they can keep cranking out hits like that, um, I guess what I'm getting to is if they can keep cranking out hits like that, they don't need a switch pro or a switch Two or anything. They are doing just fine. And you know, it's easy to say like, yeah, Nintendo's doing fine financially. They have so much money in the bank, yada, yada, yada. But um, you just don't mess with this kind of success. They are, it is, the switch is rolling right now. It with during everything that's happened with COVID and, and they sort of been the beneficiary of that a little bit, but even still it is, they're, they can't keep them on the shelves. Um, so I see no reason why they need to release a Switch 2, even if it's ready to go. Just don't release yeah. it. You're just going to dig into the sales of the Switch, which is selling great already. So I just don't see it happening this year for financial reasons. I think mm-hmm. fans are trying to will it into existence, and it just ain't. It doesn't make financial sense. Um, not with the current success of the Switch. So, so yeah, they're just going to keep cranking out games. Um, and you know, you've already mentioned some of the great, uh, games that they've got just here in the first few months of 2021. So yeah, that's my prediction. No switch pro in 2021. Yeah. And to kind of piggyback on that, I think I saw IG, it might've been IGN that report on that. Someone from Nintendo said that they're not releasing 
like any new hardware this year. And I kind of was sitting there thinking about it. I'm like, well, on one hand, of course you'd say that because you don't want people, you don't want to say like, yeah, we might be releasing something because then people are going to stop buying the switch and then you're going to stop making money. But on the other hand, like what you said, they don't really need to because the switch is doing really good. You know, I mean, I bought my wife a switch light even last year so we could play animal crossing. I think, I think animal crossing was a big driver of those switch sales. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm right there with you, man. I don't think we're going to see a switch Two. I don't think we need a switch Two. I I think especially seeing some of the ports of games on the switch and how well they run like doom eternal is not the best looking port of that game. But the fact that that game looks as good as it does and runs as well as it does on the switch is kind of mind blowing. Uh, you know, yeah. and I mentioned earlier Hellblades on there. It runs as well as it does. Um, Outer worlds is another one. Like it's, it's remarkable what that little machine can do. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah. Let's get into my prediction. You guys already know. You guys could probably see it a mile away. You know, me being the – it's kind of like being a Dallas Cowboys fan. You know, you, you you hope for the best, but you wind up getting disappointed anyway, but, you, but you're still there rooting for your team. And uh, I, I think this will be the year that we finally see Metroid Prime Trilogy on the Switch. But I have a little more evidence this time in saying this is because Nintendo has shown – that they can put Wii games on the Switch and make it work. Look no further than Super Mario Galaxy, a game that you use the Joy-Cons to like have the motion controls. You can use, uh, you can play it in portable mode, but it's really not the best way to play it. And you can use a Pro Controller even. So I'm just saying that, and on top of them uh, doing the Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition changing the controls over from the Wii to a pro controller or the joy cons. I'm just saying based off those two games, probably wishful thinking, but that tells me that they can put Wii games on the switch. Well, no more heroes was even another one. So there's a third one. Mm -hmm. No more heroes coming to, well, no more heroes one and two coming to the switch. Those are both Wii games. So just saying, I'm just saying we've already seen a, a couple Wii games on the switch. They remap the controls to fit those controllers and the motion controls if you so choose. Well, not in Xenoblade. Xenoblade, you don't need the motion controls because they don't have any. So, I'm just saying, I think the iron... Wait, you gotta strike... Yeah, you gotta strike while the iron's hot. So, the iron's hot. The iron's been piping hot for the last few years. But I think 2021 is the year that we're gonna see it. Yeah. I th- just... <clears throat> And if not, I'm going to cry like a little baby on this podcast. (laughs) So what about Metroid Prime 4 since we're in the neighborhood? Well, let's. This is another one that pains me to say. We're not going to see that game for like another two years minimum. Mm, See, I think they're linked as in, you know, marketing wise. I think you're whenever whenever Prime 4 is ready about six months before that, we'll get the Prime Trilogy. Do you think so? That's what I'm thinking. I, I'm not poo-pooing on your 2021 that there's, it's coming that, that that the trilogy is coming in 2021. I think that just means that Prime Four is really close potentially. I only I don't think Prime Four is going to come this year just because they just hired who was it was it an art director last year? They hired some like position of of that kind of level of that kind of caliber, and I'm like. We're not going to see this game for another two years. And if that's the case, then and maybe it's already there. Then Prime Four is the new Last Guardian officially, as far as how long it's taken. Oh, oh that hurts. You that know, hurts think. Oh, that hurts to think about. Oh man, I will say I'm glad that the person they hired like worked on the original Halo games. I'm like, well, dang, if it, we got that person, the game's going to look <laughs> yeah. amazing. So at least we'll we'll have that going for us. But yeah, yeah, I that was actually one of my other predictions. Is like we'll probably get an update on Metroid prime four, but it's not coming for another two years. Okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to, to encroach there, but just talking no, Metroid, dude, I had to go ahead and go ahead yeah, and get it out there. Point. Well, for me, I think that, um, you know, since I said, we're not going to get a, a switch pro, um, in, in, in 2021, we are going to get some awesome software though. So I don't think this one's any surprise. Breath of the wild two is going to come out this year, but mm-hmm. also, I know we're about to get um, Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury, but I think we're going to get a proper 3D Mario um, before the end of the year. It's going to drop in November, maybe December. 
Um, but we're going to get the new 3D Mario game uh, in 2021 as well as Breath of the Wild 2, just like we did in 2017 when we got Super Mario Odyssey and Breath of the Wild to help out the, that historic Switch launch. Um, we're we're going to get both of them again this year, uh, four years later in 2021. I can see that, to be honest, because they've been pushing Mario pretty hard for a while. And that kind of makes you wonder, you know, what what are they building all this anticipation with Mario for? I can, I can see that. Yeah. I can see yeah. that. A l- little bit of a long shot with the 3D Mario. But, yeah, I think um, – didn't Mario Galaxy 1 or 2 come out in December or both of them? I feel like one or, what, one or both of them did. Um, so even a December release date for a new 3D Mario game – you know, I think could could totally work, um, yeah. but uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's what I got for them. Man, how wild would it be if they did a Super Mario Galaxy three? Ooh, that would be nuts. You know, man, that would be uh, hmm. Just because yeah. I know when I was playing the when, when the when the Mario three D collection came out, like everyone was talking about was talking up like Super Mario Galaxy, and people were upset that Super Mario Galaxy two wasn't on there. And you know, it's it's clear that galaxy is clearly one of the um i don't know uh not successful but like it's the one that fans really enjoy like probably the most at least in the top three yeah uh, a lot of agreement there so i uh i don't know i don't know now would you rather have a a galaxy three or a sunshine two in all honesty i'd rather take a sunshine two yeah i'm almost thinking the same thing um so but that's just and that's the thing like i tried to play super mario galaxy with the motion controls and i will agree that on the switch using the two joy cons for the motion control stuff is literally the best way to play that because if you use a pro controller it's it's kind of okay it works in playing it in portable mode i don't recommend it at all because it's just not Hmm. it's kind of clunky because you have to tap the screen to collect the stars um, at least with the joy cons, you're kind of moving the right joy con around and collecting stars as you're moving around. But I just, I didn't really, uh, I didn't really get into it. And I think I'm actually close to finishing it. So I should probably just go and finish it. <laughs> um, but super Mario odyssey dude was just so stinking good that I would, I would rather have a sequel to that personally, but that's just me. Yeah. yeah. That's just me. I had another prediction. It, there it is. Okay, I just got it. Um, so we already talked about the Metroid stuff. So we'll leave that as is. I think that with the, I'm assuming the success of the NES and SNES little apps that you can get if you're on, if you pay for the Nintendo Switch online, I think that along with them saying, hey, we're going to put more games on there, I think they might have said like th- that the adding of the new games is delayed for the last year but i think this year they're either going to add in one for game boy advance games or gamecube games Mm -hmm. this is this is probably this is probably a bit of a hot take i think they're going to bypass n64 entirely and just go straight to gamecube yeah that i was just about to say no n64 there so Hmm. i could be completely off you know i just think that because again the super mario 3d all-stars got me thinking Probably a little too much, but I'm like, Super Mario Sunshine is a GameCube game. They're emulating it on the Switch right now. So -hmm. they've got an N64 game on here. They've got a GameCube game and a Wii game all being emulated on the Switch. What are you doing, Nintendo? Yeah. Who knows? Maybe we'll get N64 and GameCube and just go all crazy with it. See, I I love that prediction, but it just, that makes too much sense, Logan, for Nintendo. It makes too much sense. It makes too much dollars and cents. (laughs) <laughs> do that <laughs> well hey it also makes too much sense for them to just like freaking port the metroid prime trilogy and they haven't done it in four years so you know maybe maybe uh the more the more sense that i make in these predictions the less <laughs> likely it is to happen so because <laughs> uh yeah nintendo's crazy man I say there's no predicting nintendo Ah, there really isn't. Oh man. I get, I just finished reading a a history book on like super Mario and all that. And I'm just like, gosh, Nintendo has been stingy ever since they started. But yeah, that that's what I'll throw out there. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get an N64 and GameCube library added on there and it'll just put a a handful of offerings 
in there maybe like five games. Real small, quick aside, I gotta say it, it cracked me up when you said about Nintendo stinginess. Did you see the story semi recently? I think it was Microsoft or something way back in the day tried to buy Nintendo. And oh yeah, the old Didn't they, like, laugh at him or something. Yeah, the old Microsoft executive was basically describing it's it like imagine like these board members just like sitting in a room just laughing at you for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was so good. Uh, gosh, Nintendo, man. They're a different, they're different, dude. Uh, <laughs> some days I love it. Other days I'm just like, gosh, you guys annoy me. <laughs> you gotta love them. <laughs> but they know, they know I'm going to keep buying their stuff, you know? So same it is what it is. Anyway, man, do you have any other predictions for Nintendo? I don't, man. Um, just, uh, this isn't a prediction. I just want to talk about it in the Nintendo section. Hollow Knight Silk Song. I can't wait for oh, the game. Yeah. I, uh, and this didn't help that Pastor Deucen was going through and like getting all the achievements in Hollow Knight over the last few months. It just made me want to play Hollow Knight really, really bad. And like, can we just take just a second to be like, what a game mm-hmm. that Hollow Knight. Like that is a game that I beat years ago and I have not stopped thinking about that game. Like there are times I feel these itches to just go back and play it. That's, you know? that's a perfect way to describe it. I would, yeah, I've, I, I didn't like, I beat it and got out. I didn't go for any extra anything. I just like, yep, yep, that's it. And then I got it. But I have, I can't stop thinking about that game, man. It's like, it's just so perfectly executed in so many different facets. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really just a, a master class of a, of a 2d a platformer uh, made by two folks. It's it's just stellar. It's really, really good. It is really, really good. That being said, dear listeners, that rounds out our predictions for 2021 in, or in terms of, I almost said in regards, in terms of, you get the idea. That rounds out this episode of the Reform Gamers. If you have any predictions for Xbox, PlayStation, or Nintendo, delays, game announcements, things of that uh, nature, feel free to let us know on Twitter or on Facebook, Instagram, or if you're listening to this on YouTube, drop it down in the comments below. So before we end this episode of the Reform Gamers, some recos, some things that you, the dear listeners, should check out. If you have the means, I highly recommend picking one up. Micah, what is something that the dear listeners should check out? Oh, man. Um, almost forgot about recos, but how could I forget? Um <laughs> I'm going to say, so it's a new PlayStation Plus game this month for February. We were talking about Control Ultimate Edition, but also Concrete Genie for all PlayStation 4 owners. This is a fantastic little game. Um, Oh, goodness. Uh, Pixel Opus. There we go. Is the developer. I thought I was blanking for a second. Um, I think that might be a new internal studio for Sony or one that they're grooming potentially. Anyway, either way, um, Tyler Turner did a review of, of this game over on uh, the reformgamers.com. Go check that out. He gave it a glowing review. It's a really fun, easy platinum trophy as well if you're into platinums. Um, so, yeah, just kind of an older game, but but good, solid game, especially now that it's free on Plus. Concrete Genie. Go check that out. Yep. I'll uh, I'll second that because that platinum was actually really enjoyable to get. Yeah. Very nice trophy list. I can't I can't really complain about it. So that is a uh, one I would definitely uh, recommend it as well. Uh, as far as my records are, it's just uh, go check out the new content that I mentioned in uh, housekeeping. The Abraxia two review. You can read the review or or watch the video review, and um, and check out the um, article on or I'm sorry the interview of the one of 500 game, you know, we, we did an interview for the, I am Jesus Christ game. Uh, was it last year, the year before uh, pretty recently. And I'm going to be honest, that interview didn't instill in me a lot of confidence about this game and kind of the direction it was going. I was talking to the one of 500 devs, uh, this morning, actually kind of going back and forth over email. And I'm pretty excited about this one. It seems like they are very dedicated to, recreating Galilee um, accurately from a historical perspective, but also uh, having the player experience the gospels and doing so faithfully. And uh, especially if you watch the trailer for it, they never really show Jesus. Like you see when it's supposed to be Jesus, but you never really see him. So it, it kind of has me curious as to how you're going to uh, encounter Jesus. Cause you play as a, a young fisherman, 
uh, boy. And so it'll be interesting to see what they do. So I'm, I'm very interested in this game. So, so go check those out. I think you guys and gals will enjoy that. Um, and then just follow us on YouTube because we're starting to put content up there pretty regularly. So, uh, check that out. I'll be doing an update on what is on my Nintendo switch because as of this recording, that video is about to break, uh, 2,800 views, which blows my mind. Wow. Uh, yeah. I guess people really want to know what's on my Nintendo Switch. Um, I guess people are just living vicariously through me or trying to get Reco. So I'll do an updated one, of, an updated video of that, uh, and talk about some of the games I've been playing on there, and uh, go from there. But yeah, that's what I would recommend. That being said, dear listeners, thank you again for listening to this episode of the podcast. Uh, links and things of that nature to ways that you can support the show through our merch store or on Patreon are in the show notes. You can check those out there. If you support us on Patreon, just uh, support as low as a dollar a month. Uh, not only helps us out uh, here at the podcast, but it also gets you early and uncut access to all of our new episodes of the podcast. So if you want to get the podcast early and uncut and listen to all the goofs that uh, Skinner hasn't had a chance to edit out yet. Definitely hop on that. Uh, and as always, if you want to connect with us, you can go to the website, thereformgamers.com. We got plenty of articles going up there, reviews, interviews, uh, news articles, retrospectives, all sorts of content up there on the website. And that has links to everything else and ways that you can connect with us, the hosts, but also ways that you can connect with the community, such as following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, joining the Facebook group, uh, following us on Instagram, joining the Discord server. We are in so many places now that it is easy to connect with dear listeners everywhere. And then if you guys want to hang out with me and ask questions about podcasting or gaming, you can find me on Twitch every Friday morning from 9 a.m. to 5 not not 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. I don't stream that long. <laughs> From 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Standard Time over on twitch.tv slash the Theologian. Would love for you to stop on by and hang out, and we can hang out there. Micah, thank you again for coming on this episode, man. Really appreciate you helping us out and uh, you lending your newsy news um, uh, credentials, insight, insight yeah. uh, to the show. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah, man. With that being said, dear listeners, thank you for listening. Be a deer. Keep it locked here. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Reformed Gamers, the podcast all about theology and gaming. TRG is edited by Deer Ear Productions, so thank them for the buttery smooth tones in your ear. If you're looking for extra content, head on over to youtube.com slash Gamers. The Reformed Gamers is entirely fan-supported over on Patreon.com slash Reformed Gamers by our dear patrons. The following deer are at the producer level or higher and will forever be thanked at the end of each show. As long as their pledge comes through, or we forget to update the audio. Those people are Pastor Shay and Wesley Ray. Thank you for your support on Patreon.com, keeping our controllers charged, and supporting Logan in his never-ending quest to collect them all. Platinum trophies, that is. So be a deer and keep it locked here. Keep listening. We'll catch you later. Boy.